Okay, hello everyone and welcome to my talk about React Native Security, Addressing Typical Mistakes. Uh, actually, this is my first time speaking at such a large OWASP event, so let me quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Julia. I'm a security software engineer at Cossack Labs. Uh, I'm also a leader of OWASP Zhitomer chapter in Ukraine, and I am a huge, huge fan of OWASP, MSVS, and MSTG projects. Uh, Cossack Labs is a data security and cryptography company. We have uh, products and expertise in different platforms and languages. And my personal specialization is mobile application security for iOS, for Android, and for React Native. Like, uh, we do not uh, break stuff, we build it. Uh, and today I want to talk about things you need to consider to build a secure React Native application. Uh, we will talk today about the architecture in general, about platform-specific things for iOS, for Android, for React Native. We'll talk about dependencies and about security testing. And I would like to start with this phrase, that choosing React Native and its components means that you understand and accept potential security consequences. To understand what it means, uh, let's uh, take a look at the architecture of the React Native apps. Uh, it's just a general overview. Uh, React Native is a cross-platform solution from Facebook uh, that allows writing uh, applications using React JavaScript, and you can also use TypeScript. So we have uh, native platforms, iOS and Android. Uh, we have JavaScript engine. It can be custom or it can be native one. Uh, and we have these components, uh, the bridge uh, written by Facebook that handles messages between native platform and JavaScript engine. Uh, when you write native apps for iOS and Android, uh, you choose to trust Apple and Google uh, with their systems, with their APIs. You believe that they are secure enough for your applications. And when you use React Native, you add Facebook to this list. And if you decide to use TypeScript, you also add Microsoft. The problem here is that each new third party component makes the attack surface wider. Uh, if the bridge is broken or Facebook stops supporting it or something else happens, your React Native app stops working as well. And the same problem goes with JavaScript engines. If you choose uh, using custom JavaScript engines, you will need to deal with it as well. For example, Facebook uh, has a, a JavaScript custom JavaScript engine for iOS and Android called Hermes to make React Native applications more efficient. But you know, there are already found vulnerabilities for, uh, in this Hermes JavaScript engine. Of course, they're already fixed, but still. Uh, these are vulnerabilities for uh, Hermes for Android and Hermes for iOS was just released this year. And there are still, like, it still looks good for now. Uh, okay, moving forward. Uh, with React Native, developers deal with security for all three platforms, for with iOS, with Android, and with React Native. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with uh, Mobile Top 10 from OWASP, like similar to just OWASP Top 10, but for mobile applications. And the first item in it is improper platform usage. And uh, the sad truth is that uh, if it's hard for iOS and Android developers to use platform-specific security controls, it is even harder for React Native developers because, again, you need to deal with specifics of all three platforms. I will show you multiple examples of this. Uh, I just love this phrase that React Native is a leaky abstraction. Uh, React Native allows you to abstract from the details of each native platform, but sometimes such details are very, very important from the security perspective. Let's take a look at several examples. Uh, the first one is Secure Store. 
uh, it is a library from Expo that claims that it stores uh, data encrypted. And well, that is true. It uses a uh, keychain on iOS that is an encrypted storage. And uh, for Android, it uses key store to create a key. Then it encrypts the data with this key and stores it in shared preferences, regular storage. Like all good here, it stores data encrypted. That's right. But uh, you see, Keychain uh, persists its data across app reinstalls, while shared preferences do not. And uh, you know, there is an MSVS requirement that you need to raise the data across app reinstalls. So here we are missing this requirement. Then uh, for iOS, uh, we have hardware backed encryption uh, starting from iPhone 5S. Uh, that was released several years ago. Uh, and for Android, there are, uh, there are still devices that do not have hardware-backed encryption and probably you don't want to run your application on such devices. Then, if you use Keychain, uh, your data uh, is decrypted when your device is unlocked, meaning uh, you use Touch ID, Face ID or passcode and then your data is stored in plain text until you lock your device. Uh, while on Android, uh, this library decrypts the data just right before usage. And you see, uh, there are differences in the behavior of this security control. And if you follow uh, mobile security best practices standards, you want the behavior to be similar. Uh, you want to raise data across app reinstalls, you want to have hardware backed encryption, and you want to decrypt your data just before use. So uh, here you need to understand and fix these platform specific things. Another example of platform specific problem uh, is about uh, managing Android permissions. Uh, you know, uh, on Android, you specify permissions in manifest file. And uh, each dependency may have its own manifest file adding new permissions. It is a common practice for React Native applications to have multiple dependencies. I'd say sometimes your application may have even more than a hundred of dependencies. And each of them may add new permissions to your project. And it becomes a headache because like, yeah, you can remove some of these permissions. Uh, you can take your main manifest file and remove these added permissions, but it does not guarantee that the library can support it. Like it may just crash if you try to remove its permission. So dependencies are a headache and we'll get back to this topic a little bit later again. Okay. One more example. Now it's JavaScript specific. It is maybe one of the most popular questions I hear is that uh, is XSS is possible in React Native? And the generic answer is uh, its possibility is decreased by design. If you read some articles, you can see some explanations why we consider uh, it, uh, why we consider the possibility to be decreased like in React, React.js, and for React Native, it, it is decreased even more. But let's not go way too deep into this topic because XSS is still possible. It's a very trivial example, but still, uh, there is there's still uh, this evil function. Uh, and here is an example that uh, if you use async storage, you can pass this another library for storing data in mobile applications. Uh, you can pass these lines to the evil function and uh, these lines will take all the data from async storage and send, that, and send it to this address. So yeah, that is possible. And another example. Uh, things are getting even harder when we talk about jailbreak and root detection. Like, you know, it, this topic is not easy for regular iOS and Android teams, meaning native teams. Uh, and 
it is even harder if we want to talk about React Native because, uh, you know, there is no ready to go solutions. Maybe there are some, um, you can purchase some solution, but I'm not even aware if such exists. Uh, you can try to implement your own, but I'm almost sure that it's not possible to use just JavaScript to do that. You will still uh, need to go to the native code. And like uh, the second option is to use uh, some third party solutions that are already available for native platforms and to write bridging code for them. It may sound easy, but still this, there are some uh, challenges. For example, uh, this is a very, very good library uh, for uh, iOS security to detect jailbreak, uh, to detect jailbreak, and it follows all the recommendations from OS about protection against reverse engineering and tempering. Uh, it's called iOS Security Suite. Uh, this library is written in Swift, and I really like it and I recommend it. Uh, but um, the problem here is that, okay, you have this library for iOS, it's written in Swift, but by default, uh, React Native applications use uh, Objective-C. So you write bridging from Swift to Objective-C, and then you write bridging from Objective-C to React Native. A lot of work, it's, and it's just for one platform. It's just for iOS where we have such a nice library. And I am not aware if there is any such a good Android library. You will have to use a couple of them or maybe even write some uh, code on your own. And again, bridge it to React Native. So it is a lot of work, a lot of pain and requires uh, a lot of platform specific knowledge. Okay, getting back to the dependencies topic. Uh, a typical situation on React Native project. A lot, a lot of dependencies and they bring a lot, a lot of vulnerabilities. This is a real life project I worked on. Uh, yeah, we've created a task for the team that you need to update dependencies, you need uh, to review these vulnerabilities and to do something with it, maybe remove some libraries or to do something. And uh, sometime later, they have updated their uh, dependencies and we received that well and you know it it is after the update and you know i'm not pretty sure what is better to have 16000 low vulnerabilities or 2000 high well so like the next recommendation is just to remove these vulnerabilities with unfixable high issues so monitoring dependencies is not that easy for React Native. They're just, you are forced to use a lot of them. Uh, you will have a lot of additional CI work. Uh, for example, dependency checkers are a must. Uh, and then when you'll need to update your dependencies, you should consider that uh, uh, one update triggers another update. You may need to do some architectural changes to your application. Uh, updates may be incompatible and uh, you may face some vulnerabilities that just do not have a fix. So what should you do in such situation? Uh, first, uh, we suggest you to understand the scope of such vulnerabilities because like sometimes these are just false, false positives. Uh, if you uh, use React Native for iOS and Android, you should consider that it is also used for web and probably you do not use web parts. So maybe web vulnerabilities are not uh, relevant to your project. So you need to understand the scope of the vulnerability, document it, share with your team, because if you leave the project, someone will need to start reviewing this huge list from the very beginning. And of course, monitor uh, monitor and book time for updates in the future. And uh, booking time here is really crucial. Uh, another situation is when uh, some vulnerability is fixed uh, in the platform, main 
native platform uh, in iOS or Android. For example, when uh, iOS decided to remove support of the UI review because it was way too vulnerable. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, so you wait for the update for the native uh, part, then you wait until Facebook releases the update for the React Native. Then some teams have a, a forked version of the React Native repo, for example, to remove a part if they are not using it. So they need to update their fork. Then they wait until all the dependencies are updated. And only then you can work and update your own source code. So it's very, very time consuming. And the main rule here is always plan your time for updates. Uh, now it is uh, the last section of my talk about uh, security testing of React Native apps. Uh, because just a lot of people are asking me, well, how we do this? And uh, of course, my common answer for mobile applications uh, is using a VASP SVS and a VASP STG. Yeah, hello again to Carlos and Sven here. Uh, it is mobile application security verification standard and mobile security testing guide. And if you open the second one, you will see the note uh, that it actually focuses primarily on native applications and uh, does, uh, does not have a lot of information uh, for React Native, for Xamarin, uh, Cordova, Flutter, and other so-called hybrid applications. But the good news uh, is that you can still use MSVS because it is language agnostic. It is almost platform agnostic. Uh, all requirements are relevant for React Native applications because right, like React Native applications, they are like native under the hood. And you can still use MSTG because general ideas of the test cases, it is uh, still similar uh, like the major difference is that you may need to read JavaScript code, but in general, everything is still the same. Uh, you will still need to test uh, keychain as you've seen, uh, key store, shared preferences, SSL pinning, TLS pinning is still implemented in native code the same way as before, uh, like, mm, settings to, to allow uh, HTTP traffic is uh, are still mentioned in info list file or uh, network config like a lot of things are still similar so testing is not the different for react native applications and uh, a little bit to sum up this uh, how do we do this how do we test react native application security uh, First of all, yeah, we use MSVS. It's our. Uh, it's very convenient because it is a sort of checklist, and it can make uh, our security measurable, more visible. Uh, then, uh, as I mentioned before, we need to take a closer look on dependencies. Uh, we need to take this JavaScript code of dependencies and like written for React Native application by us and uh, look deeper to understand what native API it uses, what security controls it uses. So it requires more effort here, like to go deeper. Uh, a challenge here is that, okay, now we have JavaScript code and by default, uh, the native code for React Native applications is written in Objective-C and Java that are not the latest tendencies, let's say. And the truth is that it is very likely that you will also deal with TypeScript in, uh, together with the JavaScript. And it is very likely that you'll have to deal with Swift and Kotlin. So you see, instead of having like two languages, like in many other projects, Swift and Kotlin, you need to deal with six languages. And yeah, it's an additional challenge if you do a uh, security review, uh, reviewing the code and giving some suggestions for uh, secure coding for developers. So it's another challenge. 
And uh, the last part of this is JavaScript specific vulnerabilities. Uh, you can just Google them. I think you will find some information about XSS mostly. Uh, and but uh, you can still take a look at uh, web security testing guide and ASVS to find something that will help you to understand what JavaScript specific uh, vulnerabilities may be present in React Native applications. Uh, and uh, some final thoughts from me. So Facebook names their approach as learn once, write anywhere. But for me, it sounds more like learn once and ask uh, mobile security people for help because, yeah, you've seen why. And uh, a couple of uh, useful links from me. Uh, the first one uh, is my article about React Native application security. Uh, it has some additional details to my talk, so you can go here and read it. It has more details on architecture. Um, also, the second link uh, is a uh, uh, security guide from Facebook uh, on the official page. Uh, it's just interesting to read what do they recommend. And I can say that mostly it's the same things that uh, you've saw from, you've seen from uh, improper platform usage. These are all platform specific things, not that many React Native, like JavaScript specific things. And the third link uh, is um, uh, for OVASP MSVS. Uh, you know, uh, like as I mentioned, uh, it does not have a chapter or recommendations for hybrid applications, hybrid applications. Uh, but uh, there is an ongoing discussion and feel free to join it. Uh, we'll be glad to see your to hear your thoughts uh, like how do you use it how do you use msvs for react native applications what are your suggestions P please feel free to share your thoughts uh, okay and uh, generally that is it from me this is my uh, twitter you can follow me i will post my slides in twitter sometime later and of course i'm here in, in slack chat so i will be glad to hear your questions thank you <laughs>